Alright, welcome to section 8.5. Here we're going to use the distributive property to learn how to factor. And factoring is the opposite of distribution. So we're going to look at the answer and try to work backwards and figure out what those polynomials were before you multiplied them together. So the first vocab word is factoring. This is the process of finding the completely factored form. So if the problem says factor this, what you're doing is factoring and what your answer is going to be is called factored form. There's a couple of ways you can do this. Uh, one is called factor by grouping. Uh, in this case, you group terms with common variables and then factor out the subgroups. And the other type of factoring is just normal factoring, and there's not even a definition for it because it's just like, um, well, I'll describe it in the next couple slides. So the last vocab here is zero product property. Shortcut we're going to call it is the ZPP. And this one's really important. It says if a product of factors equals zero, at least one of the factors is zero. So if we have like A times B times C, equals 0, then we know a equals b is one possibility, b equals uh, 0 is one possibility, and c equals 0 is one possibility. So our, this is our possible answers that we want to write down. And the reason is because if you multiply things together, the only way to get 0 out is if one of those or more than one of those is 0 itself. If all three are numbers, you can never get 0 out. So a, b, and c could be single variables, but they could be something more complex. For example, if you have x minus 1, parentheses, 2x plus 5, if the product of these two factors equals 0. Now obviously you could actually distribute and multiply these together and get a more complicated expression, but that's the opposite of what you want to do. What you want, if you have a 0 on your equation, you want this side in factored form, which is why we're learning how to factor, and then you can use the 0 product property to find the answers. So this product, x minus 1, might be 0, kind of like over here that would be that would be the a term okay and then the other possibility is the 2x plus 5 is 0 so if the product of these two is going to equal 0 either the first one or the second one has to be 0 or maybe both and so then we can solve these we can say like plus 1 plus 1 so x equals 1 and then over here we can do minus 5 minus 5 and then 2x equals negative 5 and then divide by 2. Sorry, it's getting a little messy because I'm out of space here. So anyway, x equals negative 5 halves and x equals 1 would be the two possible solutions, also called zeros, of this polynomial. So learning to factor allows you to then use the zero product property to actually solve. Okay, problem solving tips. Always try simple factoring first. So simple factoring is your best bet in almost all cases. And what is simple factoring? So you could almost treat this like a vocab word because you definitely need to know how to do simple factoring. How you do it? Find the greatest common factor of all the terms, divide it out of all the terms, and then write it in front. Okay, you can always check your answer by distributing back in. So I'll give you a very, very easy example. Suppose you have 3x squared plus 12x. Okay, and it says factor this. Okay, what's the greatest common factor between a 3 and a 12? That's going to be a 3. What's the greatest common factor between an x squared and an x? That's going to be an x. It's basically the most or biggest thing that both of them have in common. Okay, then you write parentheses. You divide each term by whatever that greatest common factor was. So 3x squared divided by 3x is just x. And 12x divided by 3x. 12 divided by 3 is 4. x and x cancel. So if we take a 3x out by dividing from each of these terms, we're left behind with x plus 4. So this is the factored form of this original expression. And likewise, it says check by distributing to get back to the original. If I were to distribute this 3x back in, I can verify and check that this is what I get. And if that's the case, then you know you've done it correctly. Second thing, if there is no greatest common factor, you look and you see and they have nothing in common that can be taken out, you can try factor by grouping by collecting like terms next to each other. So to factor by grouping, um, you want to get the first two terms that have something in common and the back two terms that have something in common. And this is pretty much used when you have four terms. Uh, it can be used with more than four, uh, but it's almost exclusively, at least in the cases that we're going to be looking at, useful when you have four terms. So put the two in the front that are similar, put the two in the back that are similar, then factor um, just out of the front to something and just out of the back to something. And please look at the examples for these, they'll make they'll make a lot more sense. Okay, last thing, related to the zero product property, ZPP. 
If the equation is a zero on one side, you should factor the other side and then use the ZPP to find the solutions, just as I showed you on the previous slide. All right, let's take a look at some examples. First, uh, we'll just do simple factoring. Very, very, very basic. So you look here, you say, what do they have in common? They both have a seven. So I take the seven out, leaving behind. If I take a seven out of here, I'm left behind with an X. If I take a seven out of here by division, I am left behind with another seven because seven times seven. So if I were to distribute this back in, I can see that gives me the answer. Okay, let's come here. A uh, common factor between an eight and a 56 is actually uh, eight times seven is 56. So they both have an eight. So we can take out an eight and they both have an A. So we can take out an A. Um, that's all they have in common. If I take the 8A out of here by division, I'm left with an X minus, if I take an eight out of a 56 by division, I'm left with a seven and I take the A out, I am left with nothing else except the seven. To help visualize this, you could actually divide by 8A, divide by 8A, whatever number you factor out, you're dividing each of these pieces by. Likewise up here, you could divide by seven, divide by seven, if it helps you visualize what it is you're coming, coming over here. Okay, let's look at this one. Now we have three terms, uh, but we notice that they all have at least an X. So here's an X, here's an X, and here's an X. There's only y squared, y, and no y's. So they don't have a y in common, but they do all have at least one x. So we can factor out the x, leaving behind. If I take an x out of an x, let me show it here. Divide by x, divide by x, divide by x. x over x is 1, plus x squared over x um, is just x. And then there's also multiplied by y, so xy. Plus, and now here we have x squared times y squared, because one of those cancels out. So x squared oh, times y squared. And that will be my answer, but obviously uh, it's nice to write it in standard form. So we can move this. This is a degree four polynomial, or because this is uh, add the exponents, you get four. So you can go x squared y squared plus x y plus one. So final answer in the correct form is going to look like that. Uh, likewise, so you can see what each thing has in common and try to factor it out. Let's do this very last one here and we'll be finished with this slide. The 4, the 16, and the 12. If we just look at the numbers, 4, 16, and 12, they all have in common a 4. Then we look at the variables. We have an a squared, an a, and an a. They all have at least an a. Can we take that out? And then b, there's no b here, so we can't take any b's out. Okay, what's left behind when I divide every turn by 4a? So I'm going to write down 4a underneath each one to help visualize. So the 4s cancel, one of the a's cancel, b squared is still here. So I have a b squared plus 16 over 4, that's going to be 4. The a's cancel out completely and I have just a b here. And then 12 over 4 is 3 and the a's cancel. So plus 3. Okay, so final answer here. So this is how you do simple basic factoring. Anytime someone says factor it, this is more or less what they mean. Uh, you should always try this first even when you learn more complicated techniques later. Okay, so one of those more complicated techniques here is factor by grouping. So you notice these are laid out really nicely for you, but there are four terms. One, two, three, and four. First, still try to do common factors. So this has a j, this has a j, this has a j, but this has no j at all. So there's nothing that they all have in common. But if we notice these guys, they both have a two and a j, leaving behind, uh, here I'm just leaving behind a j, plus, uh, if I take a two j out of a two j, I'm left behind with a one. Okay, plus, these guys both have a three. So I can put a three right here, and then I leave behind in the first one a j, plus, if I divide by 3 here, I leave behind a 1. Okay, now you could think of this as a new first term, and this is a new second term, and they both have j plus 1 in common. So I can factor the j plus 1 out of this whole term, leaving behind a 2j, and I can factor that j plus 1 out of this term, leaving behind a 3. Okay, so this is common factor. So first, group the first two together, but then if I see that this has a j plus 1, and this also has a j plus 1, I can take those two j plus 1s out, leaving behind the 2j plus 3. 
So here's your final answer. And factor by grouping helps you recover actually a polynomial and a polynomial instead of a monomial. Because when you do simple factoring, you're always just taking out a monomial. Likewise, let's do the same thing here. This is a 4 and a 6, and then this is a 3 and a 2. So these both have in common a 2t, leaving behind a 3t minus 2. Okay, And here, it's a little bit tricky to see, but um, I want to leave behind a 3t minus 2 so that they'll match up. So from here, I can just take out a minus 1, and then I can leave behind. If I take out the minus sign, I'm leaving behind a 3t. If I take a minus sign out of a positive 2, I leave behind a negative 2. And so now take the 3t minus 2 out of both. 3t minus 2, factor that to the very front, and we leave behind first a 2t, and then a minus 1. Okay, so that's factor by grouping. And the very last thing is solve each equation. So here we're going to utilize the zero product property. So the fact is everything on the left is equal to zero. So let's do 21. If this product of the first thing multiplied by the second thing is equal to zero, either the first thing has to be zero, m minus 3 equals zero, or the second thing has to be zero, m plus 5 equals 0. Then we can solve each of these equations. Here we add 3, so we get m equals 3. <coughs> and the other possibility, of course, subtract 5, and we get m equals negative... sorry, a little messy. m equals negative 5. So these two possibilities turned out to be um, the opposite of whatever this number was, because we had to subtract it over to the other side. Okay, we can do the same thing here you can tell that if you write down a minus 9 equals 0, you're going to get a equals positive 9 as your answer. In other words, what number could I plug in right here that would make this whole thing 0? Well, certainly a positive 9 minus 9 would equal 0. And then here, I'll write it out, you can write 2a plus 1 equals 0. Subtract 1, subtract 1, then divide by 2, divide by 2, and you get a equals negative 1 half. And again, check that. If you plug that in right here, 2 times a negative 1 half is negative 1. Then we add 1 and we get 0. So anytime you have a product of things f in factored form and it's equal to 0, you can use the zero product property to very quickly uh, get what those answers are going to be. So sorry it was such a long video. I hope these all make sense. Uh, they're going to keep building up towards harder factoring in the future. So make sure you practice these basics and really understand them and ask questions in class. All right, I'll see you there.